first of all, thank you so much, Professor Wojciech, to giving me this short interview. It's a pleasure to meet you. And um, my first question to you is, what is, in your opinion, the role of mathematics in neurobiology? I always enjoy coming to Brazil and talking to you guys. Now, let's make sure that we understand the mathematics and brain uh, research. They, are, they have two different methodology. Mathematics is more deductive science, and uh, I consider neurobiology basically physics. And as you know, physics is based on experiments, and uh, uh, and it's more inductive science. You probably know all it, but let me just mention it. I think it started with Bacon, who is considered father of empiricism, and. Galileo and Newton basically brought it. They show that in order to study real world, we have to do experiments and based our own on experiments, not about thoughts experiment, as ancient Greeks try to tell, uh, tell us. On the other hand, mathematics is deductive science. So it started with axioms. They may describe reality or not. And then you prove the hope is that what you prove is basically the true. You might not be able to prove everything by Godel, but, but there shouldn't be contradiction there. So we have two different methodology. And as, uh, as uh, uh, Wigner say, there is unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in natural sciences. And this is article 9060, and that's basically what you're asking me. Why mathematics might be so useful in neurobiology? And I have to give credit to Antonio and to you guys by basically realizing that we need to bring a strict and rigorous tools of mathematics to experimental science to neurobiology. We have a, a lot of data from biology and people are the, from for brain right now and and this is huge amount of data and the question is always the same how to interpret it and what mathematical modeling will give us will allow us to predict so we can predict things that we didn't see yet in experiments so we can model things and uh, based on the, 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 the point is that the model that we built should be justified and, uh, by the experiment that we did. So experiment should verify our model. I think you all know that the, one of the first model, simple, of uh, brain action is uh, McLaughlin and Peter and Pitt's neural model and how, how the, exactly how we started. Like Galileo started with the simple model of gravitation, Newton gave us a better one, and then Einstein. So what happened in physics, it doesn't happen in mathematics, that model is as good as real data verify it. So Newton model was good until there was an experiment showing that maybe there are certain uh, 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 situation when this model is not a good approximation because everything, every model is an approximation. And a mathematics, mathematical model, what, what can give us is to predict certain things that experiments can say, yeah, this is true or not. If it is not true, we have to change the model. The difference between gravitational model and physics and uh, brain is uh, that brain is extremely complicated. I would say neurobiology is where physics was around Newton time, but many people may disagree with me. But we still don't have a, a model that, that will give us a lot of uh, prediction or give us, so as I say, every model is approximation. The question, how long this approximation works? If we go deeper and deeper into more microscopic uh, uh, the, uh, view, we might need to bring quantum models and quantum, like uh, quantum uh, microscoping, very small 
nano seconds to understand the behavior. So, uh, in summary, mathematics is a, is a modeling tool that allows us to interpret data and predict new things that we didn't see. And to, this will tell us whether the model is good or not. So, my second question to you is following the, the subject. And um, wo which will be um, an agenda for higher order structures in modeling neural systems? Okay, so when I got this question, I was not sure I understood it very well. So I look a little bit and I have a conjecture what it is. And actually my conjecture was true. Uh, first, I'm not a brain scientist. So uh, take it with a piece of salt. Uh, but uh, I think the analogy will help us. So when we study proteins, the first thing that we noticed after a long time, chemistry noticed that proteins consist of small chemical amino acids. And the first thing we created is a sequence of amino acids. So we bring science of stringology, study it. And we got a lot of interesting information about uh, proteins by basically counting of certain words of certain patterns occurring in proteins. But then, and this was the primary structure of protein, but then we realized that this protein is not a linear, it actually has some small loops, uh, uh, helixes, uh, spans, so it has secondary local structure, which played an important role in the final action in life, I would say. And finally, we realized that these proteins can fold in a three-dimensional structure. What the folding does, in my understanding, is, is what probably happened also in brain. The, the linear structure contains all the information about proteins. But this information might be spread out with a very long dependence. So something that happened at the beginning of protein might also impact something that happened at the end, very long range. But we, because when folding, this uh, long distance behavior becomes short distance because they fold and they're very close to each other and physics starts working. Uh, so this is important. The long-term dependency in that it's in a linear structure, it's very difficult to discover it if we work on strings, sequences, we have to go to ternary structure. This happened, by the way, in, in, in something that I know quite well in compression. When you stop, stop compressing sequences and this sequence has internal structure, and this long dependency is actually very difficult to recover. So now let's go to brain. And again, I'm not an expert. But here, what I see, what, what I understand. So this linear structure, the simplest model is brain connectome. So in a functional brain, which part of the brain is working in association with the other brain? When I walk, I have to breathe, but I don't have to dance. So there are, we can build a graph. And this is basically what is, I would say, primary or primary almost secondary structure of brain when we when we connect different parts of the brain that work together to produce some action but as i also understand listening to some talks brain is much more complicated and it is not a one-dimensional network this it is a multi-dimensional network on each dimension you have a little different network and then you connect between the different layers of the networks. And that's what I don't think we yet understand well. And so, for example, uh, how different lobs, temporal or frontal lobs, do work together to, to actually give us cognit cognitive science and uh, recognizing things. That part is when, again, going to the original model, we have enough data to produce this multidimensional structural uh, networks, but we have to understand how it works. 
and to predict and to actually uh, infer and try to explain things that happen, complicated things, uh, uh, the higher structure modeling is crucial. That's where things are happening and they are the hardest to understand. And I think your group actually has a chance to make a dent in this, and this is actually the right thing to do. This one wasn't on the on the list I, I sent you, but but I, I got curious. What can we expect from your talk? Okay, so my talk is November 8th, and actually will be about higher order structures uh, in information theory. So what the information theory for a very long time was doing was trying to understand sequences and to compress them, to find the shortest description of a sequence. But again, if sequence has long dependency, this compression would never be good. So we have to move to more structural thing. There was an article in 2003 in JACM, Journal of ACM, uh, by Frederick Brook, and I think the title was Three Great Challenges of 50 Years Old Computer Science. The first challenge was to extend information theory to uh, structures. How much information you see in structure? And I think this question, and I know uh, Anthony is very interested in this, how much we can actually understand how much information is in brain, this is too complicated. But we can, if we find a good structural model of brain, we can start asking this question: How much information you have is in a hypergraph or multi-dimensional uh, network that con connect them as a represent brain? So this will be it. I will have one example from brain. Basically, the question that I will ask is the following: Based on fMRI data, we built a simple network connect them of functional brain as a snapshot that we see today. And the, ask, the question that we ask is, uh, can we inverse, uh, 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 can we inv inverse this and can we understand uh, uh, evolution? So we do uh, inverse engineering and try to invert evolution, try to see which part of the brain was the oldest, and which one is the youngest, based on the connect on, on functional brain that we see it now. Because we believe that the, the way the brain would develop over evolution, different parts were added and the network was evolved. And we have some network right now, but we would like to go back in time and try to understand it. Uh, I show you some examples. Some of these guesses are good, but it is, uh, the, you know, I would say, the zero step to our bigger understanding. So that's what, the, and I will also talk about compression of some graphs. So this will be my talk.